Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Amen. Matthew chapter 24. Let's begin at verse 36. We got a good one today, family of God. Bible study. I pray that you're ready for some Bible study. Amen. Let's dig in. Verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came, and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, gracious Heavenly Father. You are the King of saints. You are the God of all the earth. You are the Savior of our souls. And we bow the knee and worship. And we say hallelujah, because you have given us everlasting life in you. You've given us forgiveness of sins. You have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you've promised that you wouldn't blot us out. And so we thank you, Lord God for accepting us into the beloved by adopting us into your family as children of God. We thank you, O oh Lord, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth for you are the King of glory. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Hallelujah. <laughs> you are El Kanan. Hallelujah. You are El Roi. Hallelujah. You are El Shaddai, hallelujah. You are Jehovah Shema, hallelujah. You are Yeshua HaMashiach. You are the Ruach HaKodesh. You are the King of Israel. <laughs> you are Melech HaMelechim, the King of Kings. You are, O oh Lord, everything and more. And so here we are, ready to receive a word from you. May you pour out in abundance. <laughs> we have this earthen vessel of clay that you've given us and may our joy be full, hallelujah. May our joy be full so that our cup would run over, hallelujah, because we want it to manifest so that others can see the joy that's in us, which is your joy, because it's the fruit of the spirit. And so that when they see the joy that's in us, they would ask us, hey, I need some of that joy. <laughs> and we want to give them you, Lord Jesus Christ, as we point them to you and tell people that there's only one door if you want to get that joy. And that door is Jesus Christ. He is the man in the glory, the God man. Hallelujah. The one who was wounded for our transgressions. Amen. He was bruised for our iniquities. Hallelujah. The chastisement for our peace fell upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. And so may we announce that. May we proclaim it. May we shout it from the rooftops that we have a savior. Amen. And he invites whosoever will to come. No matter what we've done, what we've said, what we've thought. There's no sin too great. As long as we have the breath of life that the blood of Jesus will not forgive. Hallelujah. And so may you give us that anointing, that boldness, the oil, which is... Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. Uh, the Holy Spirit in us. Hallelujah. The comforter. Hallelujah. The indweller. The promise that is given to everybody who calls upon your name in faith, Lord Jesus Christ. And so we thank you. May the seven spirits of God be manifested right now as we seek wisdom because wisdom is the principal thing. And with all of our getting of wisdom, may we get understanding. Hallelujah. So may the seven spirits of God overflow, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of the fear of yod heh vav -Heh, the spirit of yod heh vav -Heh, so that we could give you all the glory, O Lord, as we praise and worship you forever and ever. Your praises shall continually be in our mouth, we as one in the body of Christ, which you at the head, and we as many members, one body, forever yoked to you, hallelujah, forever attached to you as one, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Teach us right now great and mighty things which we do not know. Expound your word and edify us as we seek 
you while you may be found. And as we call upon you while you are near and we forsake our wicked ways as we cling to the rugged cross, that cross that you laid down your life freely. You said no one had the power to take your life. Hallelujah. You are God. Hallelujah. You are almighty God. Amen. No one had the power to take your life. No. And so we thank you, Lord God, for freely laying down your life so that you could save a sinner like me and save a sinner like anybody who comes to you by faith. We thank you, Lord. And we say hallelujah in the matchless, self-sacrificing name, that name that is above all names, Jesus, the Messiah. We pray and ask it all. Amen. Well, hallelujah, saints of God is so great. It's so wonderful. It's so awesome to be back with another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is open, everything will change. We got such a good, we have such a good study today. And so I, I have my whiteboard out because I still want to talk about the millennium. I still want to do that. This, this is about the millennium. This is about the millennium. This is about our positions. But in the midst of me, you know, doing some study with that, you know, God revealed some nuggets about the dark and cloudy day to uh, clarify, you know, this truth. This is truth. Okay, so I know you want truth. The Bible says that the word is truth, right? Because Jesus Christ, he's the word, right? And Jesus Christ said, sanctify them with your truth because your word is truth. And so this word, it can't be altered, amen? Because the Bible says forever is his word settled in heaven. And so when we go to the text, when we go to the Bible and the Holy Spirit takes the things of Christ and makes them real to us as he opens up our eyes to behold wondrous things out of his word, amen? And he teaches us great and mighty things which we do not know because we're little children, right? A little child, they go to their father, they go to their mother to listen so that they can learn about how it is to operate, right, in this uh, world that we call life. Hallelujah. So we as little children go into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Because except we become like little children, we can't even get there. So we as little children, as we are walking down the narrow road, we're asking, Abba, Father, teach us, right, because your servants were listening, we have the seal of God on our foreheads and we're his servants forever. And so we're asking God to teach us. Amen. And so I was asking God to teach me and he showed me this, this beautiful nugget. That's why I started off with Noah. That's why I started off with Noah because I never saw it until today. But this, this, this is another proof text. Okay. About the two witnesses. Amen. This is a, this is another proof text about the two witnesses. Amen. This is another proof text about the two witnesses. God said, as we read in Matthew 24, just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Well, it's interesting that in the days of Noah, amen, in the days of Noah, <clears throat> the first mention of Olive happened in the days of Noah, amen. Olive is Zayet, right? Zayet, that is the word for Olive. It means Olive, Olive tree, anything to do with the Olive, this is the word, Zayet. Right. This is the word. Right. This is the word for olive. And the first time, the first time, this is the law of first mention. The first time that you see the olive, right, is in the days of Noah. But I'm going to build this case. I'm going to build this case. Oh, it's so beautiful. Look at this. First, let's go to Revelation. Amen. Let's start. At, let's start at the end. Amen. Let's start at the end. Hallelujah. And we're going to wait. We're going to work our way back to the beginning. Look at Revelation because this is what God says. God says this about the two witnesses. Right. This, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Only God could do this. Amen. Only God could do this. And so this is Bible study. I pray that you got, I pray that you, <laughs> I pray that you at the table with a knife and a fork because we have to dig in. Amen. Revelation chapter 11, verse one. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and I was told rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Amen. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees. These are the two olive trees, right? These are the two olive trees. Amen. And the two lampstands, right? that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours forth from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Hallelujah. So I'm gonna stop right there and just focus on 
what God says about these two witnesses that are going to prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth in Jerusalem, right? God says that these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands because we see the same thing because God doesn't change in the book of Zechariah, right? Zechariah chapter four, before the curse goes out, right? The curse goes out in Zechariah chapter five, right? The blessing always comes before the curse, right? So before the curse is sent out, what do we see? We see the rapture, right? We see the two witnesses and the menorah connected. And then the curse goes out, right? So what happens? Zechariah chapter four, verse one. And the angel who talked with me again and woke me like a man who was wakened out of sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see a, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, the menorah, with the bowl on the top of it and the seven lamps on it, right? The menorah, that's the church, that's us, right? Filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, right? With the seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, right? So the two olive trees are connected to the menorah, right? Because that's why God says in the book of Revelation, not only are they the two olive trees, but they're also the two lampstands, meaning that they're connected, right? They're connected to the menorah, right? This is, this is, this is deep. Amen. This, this is, this is deep. Look at this. Hallelujah. Verse three. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Well, we're, go we're about to find out who these two witnesses are. Amen. Uh, I don't know who they are, but we're going to see what God says about who they are. Amen. <laughs> Verse six. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. It's by the spirit. It's going to come up. This is going to come up. Oh, it's so beautiful in, in, in uh, Genesis, right? Uh, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Hallelujah. That's what he says in the book of Revelation. I will give power unto my two witnesses. The two witnesses are given power by God because it's not their power. It's not their might. It's by his spirit through the Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit that's anointing these two witnesses during the time of Jacob's trouble to be God's spokesman. Uh, mouth during uh, the first half of Jacob's trouble, right? Clothed in sackcloth for 1,260 days, right? So back to Zechariah chapter four, hallelujah. Zechariah chapter four, uh, verse seven, who are you, O great mountain? Right? So this is talking about the destruction of Babylon. I'm not going to go down that road. Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Verse eight, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Uh oh, there goes that plumb line. This is just so, it's so meaty. You talk about filet mignon, you talk about a porterhouse. Hallelujah. This is a porterhouse. These seven eyes these seven are the eyes of the Lord, right? These seven are the eyes of the Lord. Remember the, the menorah, right? The menorah uh, is the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God, the seven eyes of the Lord. And who does the Holy Spirit inhabit? It's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We have to be born again. We have to receive the Holy Ghost. We have to be sealed until the day of redemption. We have to have oil, right? We have to have oil for the light because God is light. Amen. The Holy Spirit has to be in you, right? We are forever attached as one with the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. God in us, right? We have to have that new nature. Amen. We have to be born again. Jesus Christ said, except a person be born again. We, my goodness. What did he tell Nick at night? What did he tell Nick at night? Nicodemus. Right? Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, how, how is this possible? Do I have to enter into my mother's womb again a second time? No, you have to be born from above, born by the spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. You have to have the Holy Ghost. You have to have the oil. You got to have the oil. There's no other way. Amen. No other way. You have to have the oil. Right? And the oil 
is what destroys the yoke. It's the anointing, which is the Holy Ghost. Amen. That destroys every yoke. Right? Because God's yoke is easy and his burden is light. He says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Amen. Right? Cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. Whatever you're going through right now, is it doubt? Give it to Jesus. Is it anxiety? Give it to Jesus. Is it trouble? Give it to Jesus. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Because who the Son sets free, we are free indeed. Whatever you're going through, give it to Jesus. Amen. Because he cares for you, child of God. Hallelujah. What does he say? These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right hand and on the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. These are the two anointed ones, again, called the two olive trees connected to the menorah, right? This is exactly the same description that we just read in the book of Revelation. So, olive, right? The two witnesses are connected to being olive trees. Well, this is interesting. This is interesting because in Romans, what does Paul tell us about the Jew and the Gentile, right? What does Paul tell us? Paul tells us this in Romans, and then we're going to go all the way back to the beginning to see the end. Amen. Oh, it's just so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. Look at, look at how God wrapped this up. Amen. Look at how God wrapped it up as only God can. Amen. Uh, 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 we're just, we're just messengers, right? <laughs> we're, we're Bereans, right? And we just take what God gives us and we give it out and uh, we give God the praise and the glory because he's worthy. It's his book. It's his story. I didn't write this book. <laughs> like I said, and like I'll always say, I'm Johnny come lately. Okay. This book was here before I got here. <laughs> And this book going to be here after I leave here, right? Forever, okay, is his word settled in heaven. From everlasting to everlasting, he's God, okay? <laughs> this book stands forever, right? Okay, I'm thankful that now it's my watch, right? I'm thankful that now it's your watch, child of God, and we're in this together forever. And as long as it's our watch, until God says, hey, come back home, or the rapture takes place, right? And praise God, hopefully it's soon, and we know it's going to be soon, amen? But until that day comes, thank God that he has us on the watchtower, and we get to go to and fro in his word to get out these gems and jewels so that we could have a better understanding of the times, like the sons of Issachar, because this day that's coming is not going to overtake us like a thief, right? We know what's happening, right? We see what's going on. We see the madness. We see the craziness. Our eyes are open, right? I once was blind, but now I see. This is what God came to do. He came to give sight to the blind. Amen. I once was deaf, but now I hear. When I was lost in my sin, when I was lost in the sauce, I couldn't hear the word of God. Okay. But when Christ set me free, he said, you are loose. Hallelujah. From your deafness, James Smith. Amen. And I said, yes and amen, because the Bible says, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Amen. When he came to cleanse the leper, my goodness, I was unclean, unclean. My goodness. Okay. I was unclean, unclean. You know what the leper had to do? I was unclean, unclean. But when I met Christ, he said, boy, you cleanse. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, boy, you cleanse, child of God, just like he did with you. Right? He opened up your eyes. He opened up your ears. He cleansed the lepers. What else he do? He gave life to your mortal flesh. Amen. He raised the dead. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He raised the dead. We was dead in our sins and trespasses. And God said, I give you life and life more abundantly. He said, get up. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, get up. Hallelujah. Okay. And what else? What else he do? He came to give us uh, feet to walk. Hallelujah. Because we used to be lame in our feet. We used to be crippled, but he came to make the cripple to walk. And he said, take up your bed and walk child of God. No longer are you crippled by sin. Hallelujah. No longer are you crippled by uh, the enemy. Hallelujah. He said, take up your bed and walk. Okay. And we didn't say even on the Sabbath. No, <laughs> we didn't question them. We took up our bed and we walked 
even on the Sabbath. Amen. Because he gives us rest. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we're on this narrow road that only a few people find because this is the qualifications of the Messiah. Everything that he came to do, he did and more. Hallelujah. The Bible says, it, the, my goodness, preach Holy Ghost. The Bible says if everything could have been written that Christ did, the whole world couldn't contain all the books, right? <laughs> the whole world couldn't contain all the books if everything were to be written of what God has done. My goodness. Just look what he's done in your life, right? Look what he's done in your life. Hallelujah. Look at the testimony that you have. Okay. Look at the testimony that you have when you look in the mirror and you see the new creation as you see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look at the work that God has done. You talk about credentials. My goodness. Hmm. You talk about credentials. <laughs> you talk about pedigree. They say, hey, let me see some credentials. I, I, I need some credentials. Hmm. But look in the mirror. Hmm. You better look in the mirror. You won't see some credentials. Okay. <laughs> you better look in the mirror. Okay, if you want to see some credentials, look at the work that God has done. And he's just getting started, amen. <laughs> and everything he does is good, hallelujah. And look at the work that he's already done, and he's just getting started. You talk about the party starter, okay. They talk about get this party started. We ain't never seen no party until we see him, hallelujah. You talk about a party. <laughs> they say they get this party started, amen, okay. You talk about the party starter, okay, we got a taste. We got a taste at the at the wedding at Cana. We 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 read about it. <laughs> we read about it. You talk about the party started. His first miracle. You want to jam? Okay. <laughs> he said, "Hey, we ain't got no more wine." He said, "Woman, my time ain't come yet." Mm. And mama, my time ain't come yet, Mama. Mm. Okay, you talk about the party started. They said it. We there's only one person who can get this party started. Amen. <laughs> His first miracle, his first miracle. There's only one person who could get this party started. You talk about the jam, hallelujah. <laughs> the governor of the feast, they said, he said, hold up. Okay, he took a sip, he took a sip. He said, hold up. Okay, I'm about to fall off my rocker. <laughs> he said, hold up. He took one sip, I'm about to fall off my rocker. My goodness. He took one sip. He about to fall off his rocker. He said, hold up. Okay. <laughs> okay. We ain't seen no party yet. Amen. We get, we get, we got, we got glimpses of how it's going to be. We got glimpses. Amen. And when the party starts, I pray that you're there. Hallelujah. I pray that you're dead. I pray that you're there because he said he ain't going to drink again until he drinks it in the kingdom. Right, that cup, right, with us. Amen. And so I can't wait for that day to come so that we can rejoice and see how the party started is going to have an everlasting party with all of us. Because the Bible says the increase of his peace and of his government will have no end. Hallelujah. You talk about having fun. Ooh, we we going to have some fun forever. Amen. Nonstop fun. You talk about a thrill ride. My goodness. I'm talking about nonstop fun. Every moment, wow. Okay. Every moment, wow. Okay. <laughs> Every moment, forever, wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about every moment, wow. My goodness. I'm talking about, oh, my goodness. I'm talking about every moment, forever, wow. Okay. <laughs> He's God. Amen. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> Well, what did Paul say? Let's get back on this before uh, before I, we get too far off track. But of course, we right on track. Amen. Romans chapter 11. This is what Paul said, right? This is what Paul said about the olive tree, right? Paul said this about the olive tree. Romans chapter 11, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive branch, right? Speaking about the Gentiles, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, it was the olive tree, which is connected to Israel. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. So Paul said that the Gentiles are wild olive branches grafted into the natural olive tree. Right. So Romans chapter 11, verse 17 says both the Gentiles are an olive uh, branch and the Jews are an olive branch, right? This is this is the whole key. This is this is the whole setup. This is the whole setup. 
I mean, look at this. Look at this. My goodness. Go to Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 8. Okay, so God said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. This is the first mention of the olive in all the Bible, right? And check the pattern because we're going off the patterns, right? Because God doesn't change. We're going off the patterns. Amen. And so in the days of Noah, there was no such thing as a Jew. This is the whole point. This is the, this is the whole setup. Okay, let me tell you the thesis. The thesis is the two witnesses, one's a Jew, one's a Gentile, based upon what God said. Right? We just, we just, we just, we just heard from uh, Paul, right? That the Gentiles are a wild olive branch, right? And the Jews are the natural olive branch. So uh, the two witnesses who are the olive trees, one's a Jew, one's a Gentile, guaranteed. Amen. One's a Jew, one's a Gentile, guaranteed. Now look at this. In the days of Noah, the first mention of the olive, this word, the Zayith, the Zayith, right? The Zayith, this is the first mention in all the Bible of the olive. And it comes in the days of Noah. And look at this. Oh, look at this. And there was no such thing as a Jew. There was no such thing as a Jew, right? So this first mention of the olive represents the Gentile witness, right? And this is happening during a time of a global catastrophe, right? The global judgment of the flood. And look what happens, okay? Genesis chapter 8, I'll just begin at verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens were restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot and she returned to him to the ark. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. Okay, so remember, this is this is the judgment. This is the judgment. My goodness, this is this is the cloudy and dark day. Okay, so you got you got to think of types and shadows if you know the types and shadows of what God is saying before we break this down. Amen. So at the time of the rapture, what's going to happen? God is going to separate the waters above from the waters below. So everybody in the ark represents the waters above because the ark went above the waters, right? The waters below the ark represent everybody left behind in the time of judgment, right? Everybody left behind in the time of judgment is under the ark, right? Those are the waters left behind, right? Everybody on the ark represents all of us who get raptured, right? Because guess what? Who was on the boat, right? It was Noah plus seven others. Noah representing Jesus, right? And then seven others representing the church, right? Noah and seven others were all above the waters, Right. And so what's happening now? Judgment is still going on on the planet in the waters below in the time of the end, just as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the son of man. Now, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. OK, look at this. Verse nine. But the dove found no place to set her foot and she returned to him to the ark and the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, right? Nighttime, okay? The dove came back to him at nighttime, right? It's nighttime, right? The day of the Lord is a day of darkness. It's nighttime. Only God can work. The dove is who? The dove is the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, and who is the Holy Spirit coming back with at nighttime, okay? The Holy Spirit is coming back with somebody at nighttime, right? This is the midpoint. This is the midpoint, amen? Look at this, look at this. And a dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Hallelujah. <laughs> the freshly plucked olive leaf represents the midpoint when the two witnesses are caught back up to heaven, right? After their ministry is, is done because the two witnesses, they're in, under the waters, right? They're under the waters. They're in the judgment. But they're not part of the judgment. They're God's spokespersons during the time of judgment. The two witnesses, the two anointed ones, right? Hallelujah. The two anointed ones are uh, prophesying for 1,260 days 
for the first half of Jacob's trouble in the midst of all the darkness, right? It's nighttime, right? And for 1,260 days, no one can hurt them, right? For 1,260 days, no one can hurt them. There's a decree, right? By the Antichrist, remember another story? Another story in uh, the story about Saul, right? When Saul said no one can eat, right? There was a famine, representing the famine. And he said no one can eat. And if you eat, okay, there's a penalty. And what's the penalty? Death, right? But what happened? Jonathan didn't listen because he didn't hear, right? Uh, the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice, okay? Jesus saying that. Jesus saying, my sheep hear my voice, right? And he knows us, right? And we follow him, right? We don't hear the voice of anybody else. So Jonathan represents the sheep, right? During the time of Jacob's trouble. And what happens? He's not listening to what the Antichrist says. He's listening to what the two witnesses say, right? Because he goes to the forest, right? Who's in the forest? Well, the, in the forest are the two olive trees, right? One Jew, one Gentile, right? And the two olive trees in the forest, what happens? When Jonathan goes into the forest, he finds honey, What's sweeter than honey? The word of God, Samson's riddle, right? Out of the eater, something to eat, right? Out of the strong, something sweet, right? What's stronger, okay, than a lion, right? right. Well, what, 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 what's sweeter than honey, amen? And so what's sweeter than honey is the word of God, hallelujah. And so the two witnesses are out in the forest and Jonathan comes to them, right? Jonathan comes to the forest and he sticks his staff, Right? He sticks his rod to get the honey. Right, He eats the word of God. And what happens? His whole countenance changes. Right, He becomes born again. Right, he, That's representation of being born again. Right, Even though there was a decree, Saul being the Antichrist, a type, that if you ate the word of God because there's a famine, okay, there's a penalty of death. Right, We know what the book of Revelation tells us. Right, You're going to be beheaded. Right, And so here we see, okay, in the days of Noah, okay, the waters below the ark, what happens? The two witnesses are there. The two witnesses are in the waters below, right? For the first half of the tribulation, they're in the waters below. Hallelujah. <laughs> the two witnesses are in the waters below, and for 1,260 days, no one can touch them. Amen. <laughs> for 1,260 days. All they say a little dark, little cloudy around here. <laughs> little dark, little cloudy around here. You better come to Jesus. Amen. Mm. Little dark, little cloudy around here. You better come to Jesus. Amen. You know, you know them two witnesses, they're going to be cutting up. Amen. <laughs> two witnesses, they're going to be cutting up. My goodness, I can only imagine. They're going to be cutting up. Amen. They're going to be cutting up because no one can touch them. Right? No one can touch the two witnesses. They're the only ones. Right? And the whole world hates them, right? Okay, let's look at look at us today, right? We are the body of Christ. You know how much hatred we get, right? I was out there preaching today through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, God, you know, riding on his bike. Oh, shout out! You know how many? I mean, so many different people. You know, people don't want to hear it, right? But there's no there's no there's no blowback, right? I mean, there's there's blowback depending on what country you're in, and and has been, you know, for the last two thousand years, right? Uh, but praise God uh, that, you know, we still have uh, some type of freedom here in Babylon the Great for the moment. And we can still, you know, uh, preach the word of God uh, without hindrance because we have freedom of religion. Praise God. And it's like it's like that in lots of different places in, in the world. You can still go out and proclaim the gospel without uh, too much hindrance. But it still does flare up every now and then. But not like it will be during the time of Jacob's trouble because that's a time like no other. Right. Just like it was in the days of Noah. Time like no other. Right. Time like no other. And under the waters, who's there? The olive tree. And in the days of Noah, there was no such thing as a Jew. This is the point. In the days of Noah, this is the whole point. OK, so either we believe God or we just make up our own opinions. OK, either either we believe God or we make up our own opinions. In the days of Noah, okay, is it, uh, I don't even know how, 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 I don't even know how. But this is how, because the Holy Spirit has to take the things of Christ and make them real to you. So my prayer, because God says, pray without ceasing. I pray, Lord, that whoever you've led to this teaching right now, right here, who's listening, I pray that you would take these words, which are coming from your word, and make them real to all the listeners. That in the days of Noah, there was no such thing as a Jew. Right? 
In the days of Noah, there was no such thing as a Jew. Right? And the first mention, <laughs> the law of first mention, type it, type it in your computer search. What, what is the law of first mention? Right? Type it in. Right? Because this is a principle. Right? When you see the law of first mention, the a word first mentioned in the Bible, you can see how God builds upon that word in order to uh, proclaim a precept, right, or a doctrine, right? And so the precept that we're learning is the olive, right, the zayat. The first mention in all the Bible of the olive is when the dove, which is the Holy Spirit, comes back to the ark at night, right? He comes back to the ark at night, right, with that uh, olive uh, leaf in his mouth, okay? So that represents the midpoint of Jacob's trouble and the two witnesses coming back to uh, heaven, right? Because the ark represents the waters above, right? And uh, they have uh, finished their ministry, you see, but it's not over yet because it's still nighttime, right? It's still nighttime, right? If you keep on reading, uh, uh, Noah sends out the dove again, right? And it's, it's still a couple, uh, still a couple months before uh, he, he sets foot back on the earth, right? So there's still time, right? There's still time uh, after the two witnesses are caught back up into the father's house, which is the last half of Jacob's trouble, which to the Jews, that's the time of the great tribulation, right? And so needless to say, my main point <clears throat> about Genesis chapter eight and how we see the first mention of the olive and the dove coming back to the ark, right? Uh, with the olive uh, leaf in its mouth represents the midpoint of Jacob's trouble and the two witnesses being caught back up to heaven because their ministry is done. Right they're, they're, They were under the waters, okay, preaching for 1,260 days, right? They were preaching for 1,260 days and no one could touch them. At the midpoint, God allows, you know, the beast to overcome them, right? God allows it, right? And uh, God, you know, he flips the tables, right? The whole world starts to rejoice. They start to send gifts. Finally, we got rid of these two witnesses, right? But then, you know, three and a half days later, God does what he does. Hallelujah. Here comes the Holy Ghost. Okay. Here comes the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here, here comes the Holy Ghost. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. My goodness. The whole world was over there uh, rejoicing. Oh, it was rejoicing. Mm. It was rejoicing. Mm. Three and a half years into the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, they was having a little rejoicing joys. Okay. Having a little rejoicing joys. Mm. They, they thought, they, they, somehow they thought, I don't know what they thought, but they thought. Mm. Somehow they thought, they thought. Ooh, they thought it. Ooh, you talk about deception. Mm. You talk about deception. Ooh, deception. Mm. They said, who can make war with the beast? The inhabitants of the earth, right? At the midpoint, they said, who can make war with the beast? Who can make war with him? Who can make war with the beast? He has overcome the two witnesses. No one can overcome the two witnesses but the beast at the midpoint. Let's have a feast and make merry, right? Let's send gifts one to another. The two witnesses, they're dead, <laughs> right? Right? Three and a half days later, God does what he does, hallelujah, which is good all the time, amen? <laughs> and the two witnesses get back up on their feet, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And the dove takes the two olive uh, branches, <laughs> the dove, which is the Holy Ghost, he takes the two olive trees in his mouth, hallelujah, and he uh, goes back up to the ark. Amen. To the waters above. Hallelujah. <laughs> he takes the two olive uh, trees and he goes back to the waters above. Amen. <laughs> My goodness. And it's nighttime. Hallelujah. It's nighttime. Amen. Verse 11. And the dove came back to him in the evening and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the midpoint of the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the midpoint right there. God said, just as it was in the days of Noah. My goodness. Get in the text. Family of God, get in the text. Just as it was in the days of Noah. This is what God said. Amen. This is what God said. Amen. This is, my goodness. Help me, Holy Ghost. This is what God said. 
I mean, this is why I'm so passionate. This is why I'm so, I'm, I'm not, this, this is what God said. Okay. I'm not telling you anything except what God said. So if your beef is with me, well, hey, you got to take it up with God, right? Because I'm not God. I'm just a messenger. <laughs> but I thought, I thought that the two witnesses were Moses and Elijah. Well, <laughs> I thought, well, hey, <laughs> Hey, 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 hey. I'm going by what the text says. I'm going by what the Bible says, right? The first mention of Olive happens in the days of Noah, right? And we just saw the typology of the two witnesses being raptured, right? Being taken back up to the waters above, to the ark, right? At the midpoint, and it's nighttime, right? And in the days of Noah, there was no such thing as a Jew, right? These are all Gentiles. So the apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans that the Gentiles are a wild, are a wild olive tree, right? <laughs> right? And uh, the Jew is the natural, right? So even in the New Testament, the Gentiles are equated with the olive tree, which is wild by nature, right? And so we have one Gentile, we have one Jew. So this is this is this, this is the next thing, amen. These are the next two mentions. The next two, look it up for yourself. Type in olive, because you're a Berean. I want you to do this, amen? Type in olive, because remember, when you when you follow the law of first mention, and you follow this word, you see what God is doing. He, he's building a precept so that we can have an understanding of what his game plan is, amen? And so the next two mentions of the olive comes in Exodus chapter 23, verse 11, and in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20. So this is interesting, <clears throat> because the next... <clears throat> The next place in Exodus chapter 23, okay, this is this is the Jew now, right? This is the Jew, amen, because the first one in Exodus chapter 8, I mean, in Genesis chapter 8, that was the Gentile, right? That was the Gentile. <clears throat> so then, naturally, the next mention has to do with the Jew, Exodus chapter 23, right? The two witnesses, one's a Jew, one's a Gentile, guaranteed, amen? Exodus chapter 23, <clears throat> verse 11, this is the law... This is this, and this is interesting because, uh, in regards to when uh, we see the second mention, this has to do with the sabbatical year, right? Look at this. Uh, I'll begin at verse ten, Exodus chapter twenty-three. This is when, of course, this is on Mount Sinai, right? When God came down on Mount Sinai, He's given the law. He's given the law to the children of Israel. Verse ten: For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield, but the seventh year. Okay, this is this is sabbatical year. This is typology, the day of the Lord, right? When only he could work. And when it's the day of rest, right? But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchid. Okay. So the next the second mention of the Zayith has to do with the Jew. And it has to do with the millennial, right? Okay. So one witness, Gentile, Paul says the same, Romans chapter 11, wild olive tree, wild olive branch. The second mention, Exodus chapter 23, verse 11, <clears throat> has to do with the Jew, right? And the millennial rest, right? So one of the witnesses is a Gentile. <laughs> one of the witnesses is a Jew, guaranteed. Now check this out. The third mention is in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20. This is how we get the connection with the menorah, right? Because not only does God say that the two anointed ones are the two olive trees, but they're also connected to the menorah, right? They're the two candlesticks. And now this is how we get the connection with the candlesticks. You see, everything makes sense according to what God has said. This is his book. It's his story. Okay, we just have to ask him for wisdom and he'll teach us. Amen. Uh, Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, right? Look at this. You shall command the people of Israel that they bring you pure beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn, right? <laughs> Talking about the menorah, right? Talking about the oil, right? This is why when we see in Zechariah, right, the two olive trees are on the right side and on the left side of the menorah, right? And they're emptying, they're emptying the golden oil into the menorah. They have the oil, right? They're the, that's where the... The olive tree has the olive, uh, has the olive, right? The olive tree has the olive, right? And so 
we have to have the olive, hallelujah, which is the oil, which is the Holy Ghost, amen, in us, hallelujah. And it comes from the olive tree, hallelujah. <laughs> and so during the time of Jacob's trouble, God says that the two anointed ones, who are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, hallelujah, have the oil, right? Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, okay? Now, is one of the two witnesses Moses or Elijah as far as it for the Jew? Hey, maybe, who knows? My personal opinion, this is now, this is my personal opinion. My personal opinion about the two witnesses is that they're contemporary to the times, right? Because just like God used all the people in the Bible, they, they were contemporary to the times, right? They were contemporary to the times, even when Jesus came on the scene. Hallelujah. He even when Jesus came on the scene and he explained Malachi chapter four, right? He explained Malachi chapter four, but you have to have ears to hear to understand it. Right. He said that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Elijah coming. Right. He said it, but he said you have to have ears to hear to understand it. And a lot of people don't have ears to hear. They're still waiting for Elijah to come. When Jesus Christ said that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Elijah coming. Right. He said it himself. OK, so who are you who are you going to believe? You're going to believe, you know, uh, speculation and postulation and opinions in the traditions of men, which is what people have done for, since time eternal. Right. You know, they, they always want to substitute the doctrine of God for the commandments of men. Right? It's sad. But when the very word of God explains the word of God, people say, no, it can't be like that. It's sad. It's sad. <clears throat> Look at this. OK, this is in Matthew. Amen. Help me, Holy Ghost. This is what God said. God said that John the Baptist, he fulfilled, hallelujah, he fulfilled um, the prophecy, right? He fulfilled the prophecy. Look at this. Matthew chapter 11 this is what he says. Amen. Verse 13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, you see a lot of people, they're not willing to accept it. They don't want to, they don't want to accept what God says. They think that they know more than God. They think that they, <laughs> I don't get it, but hey, that's them. God said, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. It's, it's, it, it amazes me. Here we have the very word of God, the very author of the book, <laughs> the, very, the, the one who knows everything, the one who can never be taught, right? Because he's the teacher. And God himself says, because he, he already knows, he knows, he knows mankind, he knows us. He said, yeah, because he knew this was going to be a point of contention, even in his day. Right? He said, if you're willing to accept it, a lot of people he knew wasn't going to accept it, right? If you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. What he's saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mm. A lot of people ain't got ears to hear, right? A lot of people ain't got ears to hear. They say, no, Elijah still has to come. Well, hey, even though God said that John the Baptist fulfilled Elijah coming, but the people say, well, I, I ain't got ears to hear. And I'm not going to accept it. Well, hey, <laughs> do what you want to do. Your soul. Amen. Again, my opinion now, back to my opinion. You know, I rarely give my opinion. But because this is a hot, this is a hot topic. And I don't, I don't have a, a concrete revelation of the identity of who the two witnesses are. Only that, according to the Bible, one's a Jew and one's a Gentile. Just like the study showed us. I believe that the two witnesses are contemporary to the times. Right? I believe that the two witnesses are contemporary to the times. And I believe that the two witnesses are sent back. I believe that the two witnesses are sent back according to Isaiah chapter 6. According to Isaiah chapter 6, according to Zechariah chapter 4. Right? Because the Bible says that the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth, they're connected to the menorah. Right? The menorah is raptured. Right? But then we see a picture of the rapture in Isaiah chapter 6. Right. A picture of the rapture is in Isaiah chapter six. Look at this and, uh, and then we'll be done because then God asks, who's going to go back. And I believe that's what he's, I believe that's what's going to happen. OK, I believe this is it's a vision. Right. It's a vision. And it, it was a vision of the rapture that Isaiah had in Isaiah chapter six. And God asks, who's going to go back. Right. And I believe that's the two witnesses going back as they volunteer to go back. And I believe they're going to be contemporary to the time. That's just my opinion. But I believe, according to what God says, 100 percent, 
according to the pattern, that they're contemporary to the time. But even if they're not, God says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. My goodness. Amen. It don't matter uh, who they are. Right? It, it don't matter who. It could be you. Okay? It's not the person. It's God. You see, people want to people want to elevate the person. Right? They want to elevate the person. Right? Instead of elevating God. It's not the person. We're just vessels in, in the potter's in the potter's hands. And he's he does what he ever he wants to do. Right? And so it's not the person. It's not by power nor by might. But by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now look at this. Amen. We'll be done after this. Isaiah chapter 6. This is a picture of the rapture, right? In the year that King Uzziah died, dead in Christ rise first, right? <clears throat> At the time of the rapture, who, who rises first? The dead in Christ. So this is what this is the whole setup. Amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, the dead in Christ rise first. I saw the Lord. Okay, Isaiah, he's alive and remain. And they're all caught up. And where are they caught up? They're caught up into heaven. And what does Isaiah say he sees? He says, I saw the Lord. Hallelujah. It's the same thing we see in Revelation chapter 4. When God tells us all to come up here. Dead in Christ rise first. King Uzziah. Isaiah, alive and remain. Come up here. The door's open. Right? So we all go up. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Same thing we read about in Revelation chapter 4 when we go through the open door. The praise of God. Holy, 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 right? Same picture. Right? This is a vision that God gave to Isaiah of the rapture. Amen. Verse 4. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. <laughs> so this is the heaven shaking, right? Because at the time when everything that can be shaken, it will be shaken, right? So all of us, we're safe inside the Father's house before the shaking begins, right? We're planted upon the rock, right? The Bible says on that day when God brings out the plumb line, my goodness, preach Holy Ghost. At the time when everything shakes that can be shaken, if you're not on the rock, my goodness, that's why, that's why the two witnesses are in heaven, right? That's why the two witnesses are in heaven, and they're sent back, okay? Because everything under God's feet has to shake, right? Everything under God's feet has to shake. This is what God said, okay? Because God is light. So all the light goes with him, right? Because all the light can't be shaken, right? Table of showbread, menorah, okay? Table of showbread, 144,000, menorah, the church, right? And then the two witnesses are there because they're attached to the church, Right, the two olive trees, one on the right and one on the left. That's why God says not only are there the two olive trees, but that the two lampstands, right? Because they have, they have the olive oil. And what does God say? Exodus chapter twenty-seven, verse twenty. You have to bring the olive oil for the for the lamps, right? So we the first three mentions of the olive in the Bible, Genesis chapter eight, verse eleven, Gentile. Okay, that's the Gentile witness. Exodus chapter 23, verse 11, that's the Jew, uh, the Jewish witness. And then Exodus 27, verse 20, that's the menorah, right? The two olive trees with the two uh, lampstands, because one's on the right and one's on the left. We're all together at the time of the rapture, right? And so we're all safe inside the Father's house. And once we're all safe inside the Father's house, right, what happens? Everything shakes, right? Verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook. Okay. <laughs> Everything that can be shaken, it going to shake. My goodness. It's what God... Help me, Holy Ghost. I just get so excited. I just get so excited. <laughs> Look at the picture. This is a vision. My goodness. This is a vision, child of God. People talking about, oh, I had a vision. <laughs> this is a vision. Okay. Forever recorded in heaven about what's going to take place. This is a vision. And look what's taking place. He's showing us what's happening. Okay. This was, written, this was written 700 years before Messiah came into the world. 
right? To be our substitutionary atonement on the cross of Calvary. Okay, this is written 700 years before Christ came into the world. And he's already telling us what's going to happen at the time of the rapture through the prophet Isaiah when he gave Isaiah this vision, right? In the year that King Uzziah died, the dead in Christ rise first. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, sitting upon a throne. Isaiah represents all of us who are alive and remain, all caught up, right? And we're safe inside the Father's house before anything shakes, right? Because when Jesus Christ, when he descends, hallelujah, when he stands, okay, and when he passes by, my goodness, in the twinkling of an eye, right? It's, it's a supernatural. You talk about breakneck speed, amen? Okay, you talk about breakneck speed. Ooh, you're going to get your neck broke if you ain't on the rock, my goodness. One fourth, okay, one fourth of all the earth, they gonna get their neck broke. No remedy. Mm. Call you Mr. Stiff Neck. Mm, shouldn't have been so stiff neck. Mm. They call you Mr. Stiff Neck. Ooh, you didn't you, you didn't know about that head breaker, did you? Mm. You you didn't you didn't know about that pale horse. How you gonna get out that gate? Give you some whiplash. Ooh. Now you knew. Now, now I told you. Mm. I told you what the Bible said. When that pale horse get out that gate. He indiscriminate. He got one fourth of all the earth to give a whiplash to. And if you get that whiplash, well, mm. if you get that whiplash on a cloudy and dark day because he wanted to build your house on the sand, mm. if you get that whiplash on the cloudy and dark day from the pale horse, dang. man, mm. last day, where you at? On the left, ooh. Where you at? Last day. Everybody got that whiplash. Cloudy and dark day. Last day. Where was you at? On the left. Mm. Not only were you left behind, but you was on the left on the last day. Ooh. You talk about the double whammy? Mm. They say, hey, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Tell me a little bit about that double whammy. Mm. They say, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, tell me about that double whammy. Mm. Tell me about that double whammy. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You don't want that double whammy. Oh, no. I want the double. You don't, you don't want the double whammy. No, no. Don't want the double. Mm -mm. <laughs> Second death? Ooh. Don't want it. And so look what happens when the Lord descends, when he stands and when he passes by. The Bible says those of us who are at the meeting space, <laughs> those of us who are at the meeting place, right? Those of us who are at the meeting place, God says it's the rock. It's the hot sewer, right? Hot sewer means rock. Hot sewer, ha means the, sewer means rock. And this is what God told Moses when God told Moses that he was going to let Moses see his glory as he passed by. He wasn't going to see his face, but he was going to see his back parts. God told Moses, I'm going to put you at a meeting place. And that meeting place is called the rock. It's called the hot sewer. What's the rock? It's Jesus Christ. Amen. And so Moses was at the meeting place. And the Bible tells us that the Lord descended, right? On the cloudy and dark day, what's going to happen? The Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Amen. And the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. King Uzziah, right? In the year that King Uzziah died, right? The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, here goes Isaiah. I saw the Lord, right? I saw the Lord, amen? So dead in Christ rise first. All of us who are alive and remain, we're all caught up, right? In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Because the Bible says the Lord is going to descend. He's going to stand. That's the order. And so when the Lord stands, that's when he has the plumb line, according to Amos. Amos said he, that he saw the vision. <laughs> Amos said that he saw the vision and he saw the Lord standing upon a wall with the plumb line in his hand. OK, so the Lord, he's descended and now he's standing. And this is all breakneck. It's breakneck. My goodness. It's, it's faster than we can blink. My goodness. OK, he's everywhere at the same time. He descending, he standing, and he passing by at the same time. Hallelujah. He's God. Amen. He descending, he standing, and he passing by 
at the same time, ooh, he God, amen. Is anything too hard for God? Hallelujah. They say, they say, is anything too hard for God? Mm. He descending and he standing and he passing by at the same time. Ooh, we. That's why I said in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. <laughs> in the twinkling of an eye, we're all going to be translated. Amen. And so when he stands with the plumb line in his hand, he's measuring everyone's foundation. So there's no time to get ready. He's God. He can't pull the wool over his eyes and say, okay, I, I, I see the Lord descending now. No. I, I, I see the Lord descending and he's standing. No, there's no time to get ready. Oh, no. No time to get ready on that day. No, no. No time to buckle up your britches. Oh, no. No time to hunker down. Oh, no. No time to hunker down. When you when, when the Lord descends and when he stands and you ain't there. Ooh, we. When the Lord descends and when he stands and you ain't at the meeting place. Uh-oh. When the Lord descends and when he stands and you ain't at the meeting place. Uh-oh. Well. He passing by. <laughs> you didn't have the right foundation, right? You wasn't at the meeting place. You wasn't on the hot soil. Amen. You wasn't at the rock, right? The Bible says there's only two foundations. One foundation is the hot soil, which is the rock, which is Jesus Christ, right? And guess what? In the Hebrew, the menorah, hallelujah, the menorah has the same gematria value as the hot soil. Hot soil is 301 numerical value, and the menorah is 301. God says we have to be just like him, right? We have to be in him and he is in us, right? We're one, okay? He's the head, we're the body. So the menorah and the rock, we're one. That's why we have the same gematria value, 301, hallelujah. <laughs> God is so good, he's so amazing. Only he can make this up, amen? And so what happens, right? What happens? All of us, who are at the meeting place, we get taken with him as we go back to the father's house when he comes like lightning from east to west. You see how fast lightning strikes? It's gonna be faster than that. That's why he says like lightning, okay? He's gonna come like lightning, okay? <laughs> He's gonna come like it, right? And God says in the twinkling of an eye, we're gonna be changed. And so we're gonna be taken back to the father's house. And here we are, we're in the father's house. Here we are, we're in the father's house. And we see the seraphim saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Same thing we see in Revelation chapter four. Then what happens? Right? All of us have a firm foundation. We're in the father's house. But then what happens? Verse four. And the foundations of the thresholds shook. My goodness. Okay. Everything below is shaken. <laughs> Everything. Okay. The threshold. Okay. The foundations of the threshold. Right? That's the door. The door is the threshold, right? Jesus Christ is the door. So the foundations under, right? <laughs> the foundations under, right? Under his feet, right? And the foundations of the thresholds shook. Mm. So under the feet of the door, hallelujah. <laughs> under the feet, the foundations, hallelujah. Mm. Under the feet uh, of the Father's house, everything's shaking. Mm. Everything that can be shaken, shaken, right? What you shaking now? Ooh, do a little shake and shake. Mm. They say do a little shake and shake now. Mm. Why? Why? <laughs> why are my knees weak like water? Why? Why, why is that? Mm. Why everybody hand limp that built their house upon the sand? Why is that? Mm. Why everybody? Why are everybody telling the mountains and the rocks to fall on them? Why? Mm. Verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. Amen. <laughs> there goes the altar of incense, right? There goes the altar of incense. That's the last item. I did, I did plenty of teachings on this. Okay. Because the, the tabernacle is going to be set up. In heaven, just like the earthly tabernacle was set up, there's four items that are put into the tabernacle, right? The Ark of the Covenant is God's throne. Table of showbread, 144,000. Follow the lamb wherever he goes. The table of showbread with the bread of the presence is to be before God's face at all times. The 144,000 follow the lamb wherever he goes. 
Okay, so if God is coming down upon the clouds, he's descending, he's standing, and he's passing by, the 144,000 are to be with him wherever he goes. He's going back to the Father's house. That's why when we see the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 14, after they've been sealed in Revelation chapter 7, they're standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Right? Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, 144,000. Menorah, body of Christ. Right? And then the altar of incense, right? So we're all inside the house. That's the whole point. We're all inside the house. And then what happens? The house begins to fill with smoke. Same thing we read about in the book of Revelation. I'm already going over an hour, but I pray that you're enjoying this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up uh, by the grace of God. Amen. I'm going to wrap it up uh, by the grace of God. Hallelujah. And so this is, this is the same thing we read in the book of Revelation. Once the house fills with smoke and you're not there, well, you're, you're, you're obviously shaken. Right? You're, you're, you've been left behind, right? And you're in a world of hurt. And so this is my contention that the two witnesses are also in heaven right at this time, right? And this is what we see in the book of Isaiah because now look, God asks who's going to go back. Mm. Look at this. Verse five, and I said, woe is me for I am done. I am undone for I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. <laughs> so the, 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 the coals of fire have no effect on us as far as judgment. As a matter of fact, uh, God portrays the, coal, the coals of fire as a cleansing agent for all of us in heaven, but the, those same coals of fire, okay, are going to be thrown uh, down upon everybody under the threshold, right? Hailstones and coals of fire. Same thing we read about in the book of Revelation at the time when the altar of incense is mentioned, right? That same angel who offers up the prayers upon the golden altar of incense that causes God's house in heaven to be filled with smoke says, in Revelation chapter 8, that he takes the coals of fire and he uh, puts it in a censer and then he throws it to the earth, right? And uh, that's the same event of the cloudy and dark day because there's lightnings, there's thunderings, right? There's noises, the greatest earthquake in human history and hailstones and coals of fire. And then the first four trumpets blow, right? Along with the opening of the seven sealed scroll, along with the seven thunders, which is the voice of God. It's a terrible day. Apocalypse. I mean, we could just keep on going on and on and on. This is just the apocalypse. Right when it begins, everything's shaking. It's what God promised. God promised yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. This, this is how everything begins. Everything shakes. That can't be shaken. And when God means it, he means it. Okay, There's nothing to hold on to. <laughs> There's nothing to hold on to if you're not in the Father's house. God said that the very threshold of the foundations of heaven are shaken because the heavens are shaken, right? One third of all the heavenly hosts, they're being kicked out, war in heaven, right? And so everything that can be shaken will be shaken on this day, right? This is the apocalypse and it's a terrible day if you get left behind. That's why I'm saying the contention is that the two witnesses are in heaven at the same time with all of us at the time of the rapture, but then the two witnesses get sent back. Right. Because remember, the two witnesses, they begin their ministry concurrent with the Antichrist making that agreement with death. Right. He has a covenant of death. Right. And he signs that strong covenant uh, to begin the countdown. So but there's a gap. There's a gap from when everything shakes. Right. There's a gap from when everything shakes. <laughs> right. There's a gap from when everything shakes. Right. Up until that point when the Antichrist consolidates enough power to make this covenant of death, right? Many people believe it's six months, right? It's going to be six months. It's going to be a six-month gap from the time of the rapture and everything that happens during that six-month time frame, which is uh, the opening of the seven-sealed scroll, uh, the blowing of the first four trumpets, and uh, the seven thunders of God, right? All of that happening on the day of sudden destruction, right? And all the ramifications that it entails, right? Because of nuclear war, right? The total annihilation of Babylon the Great, 
the complete destruction of Gog and Magog, leaving only one sixth of that army, right? <laughs> and then, of course, the fallen hosts uh, being manifested because they've been kicked out of heaven, right? And now here they go, and they're consolidating power for those six months. And so during uh, those six months, the phoenix rises from the ashes, and everything that Hollywood talks about, and these elites, that phoenix rising from the ashes, the same thing you see at that UN mural, right? The phoenix rising from the ashes, order out of chaos, new world order, okay? Digital currency, right? <laughs> and then once the Antichrist, right? Once the Antichrist uh, makes that agreement, right? That very moment, that begins the countdown and then that's when the two witnesses appear, right? That's when the two witnesses appear and they come back down to earth, right? This is what we see in Isaiah chapter six. Look what God said, verse eight. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? All right, so God asked the question. This is a vision. Right? This is a vision. I believe that this vision is going to be literally played out at the time of the rapture. That's my belief. I believe everything that this Bible says. This is going to happen. God gave Isaiah the vision of the rapture. We just went over that. And so now this part's going to play out in heaven. God's going to ask, Who's going to go back? Mm. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Mm. God asked the question, <laughs> right? God asked the question to everybody who's been caught up at the time of the rapture, right? Who want to go back? Mm. <laughs> who want to go back now? <laughs> who want to go back? After we have seen, I mean, this is it. And this is it. We, we, we made it. We done crossed over. We, we here. Now, who want to go back? Mm. Who want to go back? God said, who want to go back? God said that the two anointed ones are the ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. And they're connected to the menorah. One's a Jew. One's a Gentile. Who want to go back? Mm. And so then Isaiah, representing the Jew, right, he volunteers. He says, here I am, send me. He says, Hineni, send me. And this is what God says. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Right? It's a, ter it's a terrible day. Right? Nobody wants to listen. Right? How much more during the dark and cloudy day? Right? When the two witnesses get sent back. The two witnesses volunteer to go back. Right? Because God asks who wants to go back. There's two volunteers. One's a Jew. One's a Gentile. I believe they're going to be contemporary to the times. That's my, that's my personal opinion. Right? And then what happens? Isaiah says, how long, Lord? So how long is this ministry? Right? Well, we know from further revelation that it's going to be 42 months, 1,260 days. This is what God says. God said to Isaiah at the time, and he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is failed. The holy seed is its stump. Right? <laughs> Not many people left. God said only a tenth. And God says even that tenth is going to be burned through the fire. This is exactly what Ezekiel said he saw. I forgot that I didn't do that last part. Because that one third that's brought through the fire, according to Ezekiel chapter 4, God says that he says, to Ezekiel, take that one third that I'm going to put through the fire, right? Because two thirds is cut off off top. Two thirds are going to die. Same thing Zechariah says. But that one third, God says he's going to put through the fire. Later on in Ezekiel chapter 20, he talks about that fire as uh, being uh, the wilderness experience. He says, I'm going to bring them into the bond of the covenant. I'm going to purge out the rebels. I'm going to make them pass under the rod and purge the rebels. And when I bring them out to the wilderness of the people, Ezekiel chapter 20. And so God in Ezekiel chapter four, he says from that one third, 
I want you to take a couple of those hairs and put it in your sash. A couple of those hairs is what Isaiah says in verse 13. And though a tenth remain in it, so a tenth. Okay, so this is, this is smaller than one third. Okay, so that's that couple of hairs that Ezekiel put into his sash. And then what did God say to do with those hairs that he put in his sash from the one third? He said, take some of those hairs out, right? And then throw them into the fire. Same thing Isaiah says. God says in verse 13 through the prophet Isaiah, and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again. Mm. Right? Ezekiel said, is told by God from that one third that I'm going to purge the rebels from as I bring them into the wilderness of the people and make them pass under the rod and bring them into the bond of the covenant. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel in chapter four, he takes one third, okay, makes them pass through the fire uh, to purge out the rebels. And then God says, take uh, a couple of those hairs and put them in your sash, right? A tenth. And then uh, from a couple of those hairs, throw them into the fire, right? Because even from uh, that remnant in that was put in his sash, a fire is still going to come out because God is going to purge out the rebels, right? God's going to purge out the rebels, right? And not many people left. The earth is going to be burned. Few people left, right? <laughs> and so just to wrap up and then we'll be done. I pray that you are blessed. I just, I just want to, I just want to hammer home this point. This is what God says. And I'm just, I'm going to hammer home this point. This is what God says. It's to wrap this all up. According to the pattern, the Zayit, which is the olive, the first three mentions, Genesis chapter 8, verse 11, Gentile, because there was no such thing as a Jew during the time of Noah. So that olive that was first mentioned in the days of Noah represents the Gentile uh, witness. And it, uh, this story also represents uh, the catching up of the two witnesses back to heaven because the dove, which is the Holy Spirit, takes the olive leaf in its mouth and it goes back to the ark, which represents the waters above, right? Which represents heaven, right? Because the two witnesses are going to be caught back up to heaven uh, three and a half days after they were killed at the midpoint, right? So it's a lot of symbology right there. Gentile, Genesis chapter 8, verse 11. Exodus chapter 23, verse 11, that's the law given to the house of Israel. So this represents uh, the Jewish uh, witness, Jew and Gentile, right? And then Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, that's the menorah. That's the uh, olive oil that is needed for the light, for the menorah. That's why God says not only are the two witnesses, the two olive trees, but they're connected to the two golden lampstands, right? One on the right, one on the left. And what is the, what is the menorah made out of? The menorah is made out of Jew and Gentile, right? So the same pattern is for the two witnesses. One's a Jew, one's a Gentile, right? Same thing Paul said. God said that the Gentiles are the wild olive branch and the Jew is the natural olive branch, right? One Jew, one Gentile, right? Same thing uh, we see throughout the text, amen? And so my only, and then, uh, and then Isaiah chapter six is a vision of the rapture, right? And we just went through that. And I believe that this vision, even the last part of it, is really going to happen when God asks who wants to go back, right? That's why the two witnesses, they're in heaven because they can't be shaken. They're the two anointed ones, right? They're st they stand before the Lord of all the earth, okay? And uh, they can't be left behind when everything shakes because only those who have built upon the sand are shaken. And the two witnesses haven't built upon the sand. No. So during that gap before uh, the Antichrist makes that covenant of death with many, the two witnesses are in heaven. And this scene plays out of Isaiah chapter six. Who wants to go back? And the two witnesses volunteer. One's a Jew. One's a Gentile connected to the menorah. Right. Contemporary to the times is my opinion about that. They're contemporary to the times, okay? Meaning that they are familiar with, you know, 2023, 2024. But even if not, I firmly believe that one's a Jew and one's a Gentile. I firmly believe that. And I firmly believe that they get sitting back, according to Isaiah chapter 6. I firmly believe that, right? Because they can't be shaken. Everybody under God's feet is shaking, right? They get sent back. That's my whole point. 
I pray that you were blessed and I pray that you got it. And if you have any more tidbits to chime in with, uh, chime in. And Lord willing, uh, we'll do this uh, hopefully soon to talk about the judges, the officers, and the gates and our kingdom responsibilities uh, 30, 60, 100 fold. Uh, uh, Lord willing, keep me in your prayers and I love you. Until we talk again, Maranatha. Amen.